Uh, thanks, St. Paul. Ladies and gents, uh, evening very much. Here I tweet out and I ask uh, the, the wisdom of the Twitters out there. Uh, and this is what you all said last year. 62% of you said that you would have a green 2019. Uh, spoiler alert, you were right. I know it doesn't feel like it, but our market is up for the year. So then this week I asked peeps, what are they expecting for 2020? And uh, 52%. Um, yeah, folks are getting nervous. You know, the key thing with this year is that I mean, if, if you were in ETFs, whether they be global or local, you've actually had a fairly good year. You've made the local ETFs are up 10 or 12 percent, including dividends. The offshore are up 20 or 30 percent, including dividends. But man, it doesn't feel like it. That's the point. I mean, there's the reality, which is it's not bad. And of course, if you're in individual stocks, well, it depends which individual stock. I mean, make no bones about that. But then Brad Kamala, a friend of mine, tweeted this this, this morning. So 2015 was Nene Gate. I did a power hour the night before Minister, then Finance Minister, got fired. Uh, 2016, obviously Trump won. Uh, that was a little bit before. Uh, Steinoff happened about a day before the power hour of 2017. December, when we were doing this power hour last year, we were in the midst of the worst December since the Great Depression. And we're not talking the 08 depression we're talking the 1929 depression in other words the proper old old one and then of course bright being the optimist is center rally maybe uh, <laughs> so i actually wanted to my my rebuttal to him was going to be saa gets business rescued but that had broken about 20 minutes beforehand we will come to saa hey center rally would love it would be really really cool so let's delve in <clears throat> As Paul says, every year I make some predictions. The key point is come back and mark yourself in predictions. It's one thing. You know what this industry does? We make a billion predictions, but no one's ever held accountable. You know, they go on TV and places and they say things and it sounds great. And they never come back and said, I said this and that happened. So here's what I said a year ago, almost exactly to the day. Uh, it was the 6th of December when we did it last year. Um, I said that the top 40 would be green. We are <clears throat> indeed green. I also said that if we could do 10% for the year, there would be bubbles. We will get to that in a moment. I said the czar would be stronger. We're actually 6% weaker. Iran is currently the least volatile it has been probably since like 1880. Um, but at only 6%, although within that, there's been a bit of a range, but it's been a lot less volatile this year than we usually see. I said we would have no trade peace in our time. That was an easy one. No, that, that you can carry on saying forever and a day, you'll be right. I said there would be load shedding. <laughs> we are currently load shedding. Um, I said that there would be lots of talk around inversions and interest rate inversions and yield curve inversions and all of those type of things. Uh, and there would be the, world, the word of the year and boom, we had inversions galore. The US uh, two year, 10 year, the US uh, three month, two year and the US two year, five year all inverted. Don't worry what it means. But however, every single recession has been preceded by a yield curve inversion. Very important. Not every yield curve inversion has a recession that follows. But it does mean that we've got the blocks in place for a recession. It doesn't mean we will have a recession. And I'm talking about the US, of course. I said the S&P 500 would be a little bit green. Yeah, 26% later, I was wrong. Um, and my reason for the 20, for saying the S&P would be a little bit green, because, man, this thing has been rampaging like there's no tomorrow. And I thought at some point it needs to pause. That statement is totally true. It just wasn't this year that it's pausing. Maybe next year, 26% on the S&P. I said no junk status for South Africa. Thank you, Moody's. We have three feet in, but we're still not junk status. I said GDP under 1%. It breaks my heart. I am right. In fact, I could have said GDP under half a percent. We don't have Q4. Q4 is going to come out uh, late Feb, early March. We're, gonna, we're not going to get half a percent GDP for this year. The crisis around that is quite simply population growth is one and a half percent. GDP is half a percent. That means the average South African is one percent poorer per year. Of course, that is not completely accurate because it's not the rich South Africans. It's the poor getting poorer and poorer and getting squeezed. And that really, really hurts. Uh, I said that you're still avoiding the construction manufacturing. Look, that's an easy one. I actually removed it this year because I've been saying it for six years and it's just like, <laughs> it's too easy. I, I would tell you when to buy construction and the answer is you will never hear from me. Um, I said financials were cheap. I'm right. They were cheap. They are cheap. They didn't go up. So I was wrong. 
Um, I also said that retailers were cheap and well positioned. And I was right. They were cheap. They were well positioned. I was wrong. They went down. Um, and I said Europe would be the best performing economy broadly around. It was up 20 odd percent but it got beaten senseless by the S&P 500. So it kind of, I was right in that it was good, but I was not right in that it did great. But truthfully, those are the three that I got wrong that really, really stand out. The financials and the retailers, I'm going to come back and I'll park on those in a moment. And S&P, I said slightly green and it knocked the stars out. I'll come back to that as well. So uh, not a bad year at all. And I actually let uh, Chris Dieron on The Secret in the podcast last week around predicting, and she calls it momentum. And that's true. The mistake we make with predictions is it's way more fun to stand up here and say everything's going to be 100% different. Uh, Stian Jakobsen from Saxo Bank does it. It's 10 outrageous predictions. And if I go and make outrageous predictions, I'll be on the front page or something tomorrow, and then I'll be wrong. And then I, next year, I just pretend I didn't say it. The truth is, is that trends tend to continue. And they tend to continue longer than we think. So but broadly, predicting is saying, well, what we have now is pretty much going to carry on. And, and that's A, a cheat, but it's B, true. And C, it's why my hit rate on predicting before this year was over 70% and now drops to just under 70% for, for with a less than stellar record for 2019. I also suggested some stocks, and we have various different winners. Uh, CS Top 50 up 12%, EU up 23, which is great, but S&P beat it. Pick and Pay down 8, Bulletin up 35, NASPAS 13, I've included multi-choice and process in that because they are spun out, they existed in January within. Uh, property 1%, including dividends. Now, that's not the scary one. ShopRite minus 30 3%, including dividends. Mr. Price, minus 24%. Finney, zero, saved by dividends. It was negative, but dividends take you to zero. And Satrix, 40, top 40, up 11%, which means there are bubbles afterwards. Because this time last year, I said that the market would be green, and if we did more than 10%, I would buy bubbles. Uh, truthfully, and Paul bought the bubbles. Thank you, sir. Um, but he has, you know, like like when I made that promise, when I said more than 10%, I meant like, you know, do 20 or 30. I didn't mean 11. Come on, give a guy a break. 11%. Here's the scary part. I was on TV with Brad Kamala in the middle of this year, and we were talking around at that point, we were 11% up year to date. We were rocking. And I said, you know what, we should just shut this market and go home for the year. Well, we should have because we've done ex exactly the same. We have for six months done nothing. I mean, we haven't, right? We've gone up, we've gone down, and down and up and down and up. But we were having a rocking start and then we had a zero happened in the second half of the year. So we did 11%. You know what? Inflation, let's call it 4%. 11% is a 7% real return. That is real. That is proper. That's why I say, notwithstanding our GDP, the richer, if you have investments, you are richer. You have your net worth is up because you've beaten inflation. It just doesn't feel like it. It absolutely does not feel like it does not like nothing feels great or celebratory or fun or anything like that. So that was what I said last year. What do I say this year? There are burning questions. And I'm going to give you a whole lot of answers to a whole lot of things. And I'm going to preface it up front and say it might go pear shaped next year. Every year I've done this, I think this is my sixth one I've done, maybe six, seven, something like that. Um, and it's, it's, this has undoubtedly been the hardest I've had to do in, in terms of trying to look at what's going to be happening in 2020. And I, I'm taking a moderately conservative stance. I'm not going on any crazy outlandish predictions like Trump will go to jail or, or Brexit will go to Mars or something like that. But there is a real risk out there in the current space we are, and I will delve into and, and, and identify as I do, um, that when I come back in a year's time, it just like everything I said looks ridiculous and naive and completely and absolutely wrong. So don't forget the pairs. Everything I say, there's pairs over my shoulder like a banker, you know, the asterisks, the T's and C's. There are T's and C's this evening. And the first is that our economy is broken. I mean, it breaks my heart to say it, but it is completely and absolutely true. Um, we have an economy that is is just just not working. In the last seven quarters, in other words, from January of 2018, seven quarters, we've only had three where GDP actually expanded. We've had four 
negative GDP counts in seven quarters. We are currently, as I talk, experiencing load shedding, notwithstanding that Unit 1 of Madupi went online last week. That is 600 megawatts of power, but where is it? We are load shedding. Now, I, our economy is just it is it is it's it's not that it's fragile or anything it's just currently broken is it fixable of course is it going to be fixed well that's politicians and who knows more importantly is it going to happen quickly the answer is no it's not going to happen quickly it, it's going to take time this is not something which we're going to wake up in a week and our economy is suddenly roaring the point is is that we can do this Look at those green bars there when the three M's were running our economy, Manuel Mbeki and Mbeweni. Mbeweni at that point, obviously, at the Reserve Bank. We were absolutely rocking along. You know, I, I've had arguments, most notably with David Shapiro, where, where he says that the ANC fundamentally doesn't know how to run an economy. And this graph proves that statement to be a lie. I get in the early 2000s, there were some tailwinds which helped us. You know, the credit expansion, the expansion of social grants and the commodity boom. The point is, is you've got to make something of, when you're handed something, you've got to make something of it. And we were able to do it. And we fundamentally did do it. But these last seven quarters that we see right on the far side over there explain to us, you know, we, we talk around that last decade. It was actually only nine years. It felt like an infinity. But you don't just fix something overnight. And this is going to be slow and painful. And, and I mean, I say it again, our economy is broken, and that is an absolute tragedy. The, and I wouldn't call it good news, but the economy is not the market. And I will bring a slide up. In three slides time, I will show you a slide that fundamentally proves that. The economy is not the stock market. The point is, we live in the economy. You know, this is where we live. This is where we earn. This is where we holiday. This is where we buy our goods and spend our money and own property and all of those sort of things. So it is directly hitting and impacting and truthfully hurting us as South Africans. It's not the end of the world. It's just not lacquer right now. And the, 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 the light at the end of the tunnel may or may not be a train, but whatever it is, it's very far away. That's the problem. It's the farness away. And we believed on Valentine's Day last year, when then President Jacob Zuma resigned, that uh, three days later, everything would be fine. And when uh, now pro pro uh, President Ramaphosa announced his, ca his cabinet in late February of last year, Iran was 11.50. The, youth, the, you know, the optimism was tangible. The mistake we made is that this stuff is slow. We're, we're turning around the Titanic, and it's lying at the bottom of the ocean. It's not going to be easy. So where are we? So let's go back two years ago. We had Nazarek. I mean, let's not forget. I mean, you know, there's a lot of talk around there around the lack of a new dawn, and I, I, I hear and I, 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 can, I, I can sympathize with the sentiment. But let's not pretend that we aren't in a better place. Firstly, I mean, let's go to Nazarek where uh, Ramaphosa won basically 52-48. That was a, a two-horse race, and it was close. It was almost a photo finish. Um, and there is no chance that it is still a 52-48. He is stamping his authority. He is moving forward. SAA is proof of that. I'll come to more of that in a moment. However, it is just as per usual. Things are slow. Politicians are politicians the world over. We would be better without them. If we moved every politician to Mars, the world would be rosier. Was it Belgium? You had no, no parliament for like a year. You know what? The country worked. The economy went, made money, stuff happened. No politicians. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, like we should go back to those Plato and, and, and Aristotle Oaks and like this whole politics idea might just be horrendous after all. Um, we are in a better place than we were pre nazarek Of that, there is no doubt. We are seeing ex-cabinet ministers being arrested. We are seeing perpetrators of VBS being arrested and put into administration. We are seeing things happen. They're just not massively tangible. And what they're not doing is putting randellas into our pockets or points onto the JSC. They're, they're intangible in that sense. Um, so it does feel very dark. I want to stress, and I'm going to say it, and I'll say it twice because it's very important, we are not Zimbabwe, we are not Venezuela. 
We are not Zimbabwe. We are not Venezuela. If you want, come to me afterwards and I can give you the exact reasons and details, etc. Why not? Uh, simplest reasons. Zimbabwe, Matabele, we never had that. We never had what you know, we just, those are not our economies. We are, if anything, probably a, we're probably a, 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 a sort of a Latin American or maybe a Eastern European type of economy, which means that we can muddle along forever, but we are not in any way Zimbabwe or Venezuela. Can't stress that enough. We're also not on the road right now to an IMF bailout. And the reason I know that is quite simple, because the IMF was in town two weeks ago, and they said lots of horrible things about us. I mean, true things, but horrible things. It's not their fault. Um, and But we're not currently negotiating a bailout. A bailout is not Minister Mbaweni phoning the IMF and say, hey, hey, please send e-wallet. Um, it is months and months, if not years, of negotiation. And those negotiations haven't started. So if they were to start today, maybe we get money in June. In other words, that if there is a bailout, it is a ways, a ways. I also wonder what the big freak out about the bailout is, right? If we get the bailout, what are we going to be? The terms and conditions will be issues such as austerity, such as no bailout of SOEs, which frankly is what much of the, 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 the economy and, and people are crying out for. Um, the, the terms and conditions that come with the bailout are onerous, but in theory, good for an economy. Now, we can debate the, the whole move, etc. Not, no, let's not go down that road. Last point on IMF bailouts, they, they're not necessarily the worst thing in the world. And many, many, many economies have had. The UK in my lifetime has had two IMF bailouts. And I know I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> I mean, hopefully we don't need one, but if we do need one, hopefully we get a quick one because if we need it, well, then you need it, right? Like you don't want surgery, but if you need surgery, make the surgery happen. And then there's this lady. So I ended the last year with a slide of her, Shamil Patoy. Um, she is absolutely awesome. She's out there who's supposed to be arresting people. And the question is, where are the arrests? And the problem is twofold. One, we have due process, which is a good thing. Um, and two, she took over a national prosecuting authority that had been gutted. And Boweni gave her money in his medium-term budget policy. Uh, we will, we are starting to see arrests. We have ex-cabinet ministers who are currently facing, uh, uh, well, on bail, having been arrested. It is, again, slow. And I appreciate we don't have time or interest in slow. And, and you know, someone was, was, was the other day was saying to me, oh, but it's not fair. I didn't break it. I agree. We didn't break it. But this is our country. And we're going to have to fix it. Or what? What? I mean, like, we've got to fix it. We can't just sit by and say, well, hell, you know, I don't know, we'll move to Zimbabwe instead. You know, somebody broke it. I get it. But it's up to us to make it work. Because trust me, the Oaks who broke it are not coming back to fix it. And truthfully, even imagine if they came up and like, we, we'll fix it. It's like, no, 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 you, you, you go back to Dubai. We do not want you to fix it. You, you, like, you broke it in the first place. Uh, so next year, Moody's. So Moody's are the only people who don't have us in junk status. Uh, contrary to their name, Moody's are actually quite affable people um, and quite slow to junk. Uh, they are going to come back in February and they'll come back again at the end of the year. I don't think we can avoid full junk status next year. I don't see how we can make it happen. Mbaweni needs to find 50 billion czar by budget. That is February. What's budget? Mid-Feb? Uh, State of the Nation's about mid-month. So let's say he's got uh, 10 weeks. Let's be generous. 11 weeks. Five billion a week. I mean, there ain't no sofa big enough in the world. So what's going to happen? His lack of 50 billion, he's got options, right? His options are raise taxes. Can't. We're taxed. I mean, there's just not enough enough economic activity right now to tax. Raising taxes is not going to solve the issue. Um, he can uh, uh, default on some debt, can't do that. Basically, he's got to take more debt on board. And then we all get freaked out about our debt levels, our debt to GDP ratio. It's going to be hitting, you know, 60%, etc. cetera. Let's pause a moment and think about Japan at 220%. I know, we're not Japan, a deeply industrialized economy. Uh, most of Western Europe and North America at around about 100%. I know, we're not Western Europe and North America. The problem is, is we remember the triple emios, Becky, uh, Manuel, and Mbaweni, when our debt to GDP was, you know, 38, 40, and falling. We had tax, we had you know, budget surpluses those years. We had tax cuts year in and year out. 
proper tax cuts, not just bracket creep adjustments and the like. Um, so uh, our debt to equity, uh, sorry, debt to equity, our debt to GDP is creeping high, but uh, you know, 60%, 70% is a horror number, but it is not a end of the world number. It is not things are dying. What's critically important in our life is that our debt as a country is mostly denominated in czar. Less than 10% is in, 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 in mostly dollars and euros. And the reason why that's important, and I'll use Turkey as an example. So Turkey debt, about half of it is in euros. So when the Turkish lira collapses 50%, their debt goes up 100. And the debt repayments go up 100. And I remember having the debate in the early 2000s that we should be taking more foreign currency debt. Fortunately, no one listened to me because I was wrong. It was a stupid decision, a stupid idea that I had. Because our debt is dominated in czar, it means that currency doesn't impact it. What it also means is that, truthfully, we just print our way out of debt. I mean, but then inflation and stuff and IMF and all of those sort of things. But I do think Moody's is likely to junk us in, in, in next year, whether it will be just after the budget or whether they'll wait for the, the sort of uh, fourth quarter. I think they'll wait fourth quarter, but one or the other. And trust me, when it happens, there will be hysteria. It will be the end of the world. And then the next day, the sun will rise and you won't all be dead. Because here's the slide I promised you. See, here's Brazil. And I've had this slide up most years. So let's go all the way back to 2015. S&P downgrades into junk. Finch downgrades into junk. S&P sticks the knife in and downgrades them again. Moody's comes along. Johnny come lately, downgrades to junk. The president gets impeached. And the market goes from, let's call it 40,000 to let's call it 110,000. Two important lessons to take from that. The market is not the economy. And that proves it. The market is not the economy. Why? Because those Brazilian companies are doing business all over the place. And also, this is an index, so it's the best of the best. So take our top 40. Two-thirds of the revenue from the top 40 comes from beyond the borders of South Africa. But also those companies in the top 40 are the best in South Africa. Because the bad, the losers, Steinhoff, Tongard, African Bank, they get booted out. So are there companies struggling? Are there companies losing money? Are there companies going to the wall? Yes. Is that happening because of the economy? Well, yes, and also because of fraud. I mean, let's not kid ourselves, right? Turns out we have crooks everywhere. Like everywhere. And I mean, and world-class crooks. I mean, we make, when we do crooks, we don't kid around. Hey? Like, our crooks are like the best. Uh, Please don't make that our heritage. <laughs> um, it's the same here. It's the same everywhere. Your mark, I mean, you know, your market is not your economy. What there's also a, so so when we get downgraded to junk, the JSC will get slammed. Our bonds will go crazy. The rand will collapse, and then it'll all revert back to normal. Why? Well, because being in debt does mean that some peeps won't be lending us money anymore because they can't because we're junk. But we also pay 9% and we've never defaulted. And 9% in a low interest rate environment is a ginormous yield. When the only risk is that the SA government runs out of paper to print money. You will get your 9% back. Here's a random factoid. Brazil, full junk. Their 10-year government bonds trading at about 7.3%. South Africa, not full junk. Our 10-year bond trading at 9%. We are being priced more risky than Brazil and they're in junk. Now, there's some oddities. A lot of the trade war stuff, soya, which was being bought from the U.S., is now being bought from Brazil. I mean, there's oddities happening out there. But, you know, it's not a linear thing that junk, end of world. It will feel like it. But like most things, when the news gets really, really, the world is ending, the best advice, turn it off and have a drink. Because so far, notwithstanding hundreds of dire warnings, the world has not ever ended. Not, not one time has our world ended. So then we have a budget in February next year from Minister Mbaweni. Uh, he is not enjoying being finance minister, truthfully. He would much rather be doing avos in, in Mpumalanga. But the point is, he is finance minister. He needs to find $50 billion. Uh, He's not going to find it. Um, 
ESCOM debt, 400 and something billion as well. Uh, I'll come to that in a second. Uh, unions tax revenue. So SARS is on the mend. Again, I stress about the mend part. SARS doesn't get broken. and It didn't get broken in a day, and it ain't going to get fixed in a day. But we know we have the right people in place. We know that most of the crooks are out. We know that SARS of today is better than SARS of two years ago. We also know it's not as good as SARS of 12 years ago. Yes, but we can get back to 12 years ago. We have hope. You know what we do in South Africa brilliantly well? Is elections, aside from crooks. We do elections. We have elections. Somebody wins, and the losers go home very unhappy. And then they plan and plot and everything to win next time. But we do elections. And that is something which we kind of just sort of take for granted. But look around at, 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 at other elections that are happening and all the accusations and claims, and I'm talking here about Brexit and U.S. elections, not about Zimbabwe and Venezuela. We are very good at doing proper, fair and free elections. And yes, the losers plot against the winners, but they do go home and plot at home. Now, everyone's like, oh, but Ace is plotting against, Zuma, uh, against Ramaphosa. Of course he is. He lost. What does a politician do? When you win, the first thing you do is plan how to win next time. And when you lose, the first thing you do is plan how not to lose next time. It's what politicians do. So this budget is going to be horrendous. And let's start with SAA, which I'll come back to. Let's touch on SAA. I've got a picture here. Yep, there's my SAA picture. So I, I actually I said this a month or so ago. So I've been flying SAA for 20 years. I can't fly SAA anymore because it's important that when I plan to fly, I actually arrive somewhere. So when they were on strike, I had three SAA flights, and they put me on Mango. You know that somehow the first Mango flight in the morning, number one flight, can be delayed an hour? Like, what happened? Like, did someone oversleep? Actually, no, that, that must be what happened, right? Someone overslept. I mean, like, the, the, the flight late at night, delayed, of course. But the first one, Mango somehow delays the first flight. So here's the thing. They're in business rescue. Uh, they are in the Dwang. I think they'll get an equity partner. Kami is quite interesting because of SAA. I mean, whether SAA goes down or not, there's going to be less SAA flight, right? I am one individual who for 20 years has flown SAA and will not book SAA next year except my Voyager miles. And then I will like literally go to the airport, check an airplane and say, I want a Voyager mile on that plane, please. Like I want it to be revving up. Like I want to know it's going to happen. So I'm going to go fly on somebody else, which is going to be good for the somebody else's. Listed as Kame. Interestingly, SAA owes Kame 1.2 billion. They've probably paid about 400 million of it. The other 800 million is not coming. That is, like, sorry, not going to get it. But Kame is going to be potentially a winner here. I do think they will find an equity partner. I'm not going to go into the details because of time. It's going to be messy. But what happened here at SAA was the union threatened to strike, and SAA management locked them out. They said, you don't strike. We just like closing the business, like we shut down. So they shut down for what was eventually, what was it, about 10 days in total. Um, and that was a shot across the bowels. Why? And it breaks my heart to say this, but Sura Maposa, who made the unions in the 80s, who is a unionist man at his core, is going to have to break them. And I am, I am a unionist. I believe in unions. I, I support them as a concept. But in this case, Suhum Opposer, and particularly, there are two he needs to break, and that is quite simply ESCOM and government employees. And SAA was the test. So now when he goes to negotiate with ESCOM, and the workers are like, what are you going to do, shut us down? He's like, well, hey, looky, looky, SAA, I'll shut you down. Now, he can't shut down ESCOM. I get that. He could shut down the government. I mean, would we notice? <laughs> I mean, I've got to renew my driver's license. If you could do it after my driver's license is renewed. So I think SAA has been a test case. Government has gone fairly hard at them. They shut them out. They said not interested. Eventually, when the workers went back to work, they got exactly the same deal that had been offered to them before they went on strike. So they didn't get any improvement in their deal. And the small print says all of this happens if we get 2 billion rand from government. In other words, oh, dear. If you don't, yeah, so they're not getting their increases because now business rescue and the money goes somewhere else. So I think SAA has been that test case, but there are much harder jobs to still come, and that's the public sector wage bill, and it is ESCOM. ESCOM's 400 billion debt is a humongous crisis. There are a number of clever ways we can solve that problem. I think the cleverest is PRC issues a 10 year zero coupon, 200 billion rand bond. 
which effectively takes half the debt off ESCOM's balance sheet, and it gives ESCOM 10 years to repair it. And if they default and PIC loses, two, loses the 200 billion, that's on us as taxpayers because PIC is a defined benefit. In other words, your pension's guaranteed, which means taxpayers pay. And I know it's not fair, but you know what? You can either be fair or you can have lights. Further, PIC is funded at about 108%, so PIC has actually got more money than it needs. So there are clever ways we can fix this. There are absolutely solutions out there that make it work. So the debt's one thing. The other thing is breaking power stations and then simply too many staff. And too many staff is going to be the big deal. And that's what, I mean, basically that's where the 50 billion comes from, except like February, TikTok. Eh? So budget's going to be a horror story. I think Comair is going to be one of my punts for the year. And I think SAA will get an equity partner, but I've got to find a new airline with nice lounges and on time and Voyager miles. The irony is I get a thing today from Nedbank. Oh, spend and earn Voyager miles. I'm like, guys, have you not seen the news? <laughs> so the RAND's been treading water and it's actually been doing okay. I mean, it's look at the, So that there is the big dip is uh, Ramaphosa's cabinet announcement. We went to 11.50. We've been bouncing around. That big spike out there is actually uh, Nene being fired. It actually went to 18. These are month end numbers, so it doesn't show the full pictures of them. Um, the RAND has been kind of treading water. We're a little bit weaker this year. And it can go one of two ways. And I know for a predictor saying, on the other hand, is really wasting everybody's time. But if I am right and the world doesn't end next year, the RAND should strengthen. But if things go horribly pear-shaped, and I'll come to some of those in a moment, the RAND goes weak. It's as simple as that. So I'll come back to it. Top 40, we are still broadly in our five-year sideways market. This is now the third year in a row, which I will say to you, I have never seen something like this before. It was true a year ago. It was true two years ago. It is true today. But the fact that I've never seen it before, well, patently it means that I should get out more. I don't know. I mean, like, this is just what it is. However, the market is cheap, cheap, cheap. And I'll come back to that more in a moment. Bitcoin, still, unless you are a drug dealer or a crook, Bitcoin is struggling to find a purpose. And truthfully, five years ago, I would have said to you, blockchain is interesting, but it turns out blockchain is struggling to find a purpose. I own two just in case. Um, my plan is, is that when, when the two Bitcoin are enough to get me into a, a space trip, I'm going to go to space with my two Bitcoin. The problem is, is that the price of space trips is coming down, but Bitcoin is coming down faster. Like they're both heading to zero and I might never get to space. I also got age constraints. Um, no, you've got to be under 75 and highly fit. And I'm only one of those. <laughs> Trade wars. Yeah, you're trying to work out which one, hey? <laughs> So trade wars a year ago, I said, are messy, ugly, hurt the global economy, are not going away. So I'll say it again. Trade wars are ugly, messy, hurting the global economy and not going away. But here's a thought that I had in the last week or so preparing this presentation. There has been an assumption by people, you know, media, me, talking heads, politicians, that Trump was in control of the trade war and he could wake up one day and end it. And that might have been true. I don't think it is true anymore. So two things have happened. He signed the two Hong Kong bills and understand that as far as China is concerned, Hong Kong is theirs, as is Taiwan, as is Nepal, et cetera, et cetera. And go and read about the opium wars and how, I mean, basically England to make money was uh, selling opium into, in, into China. And China said, this is killing our people. Please stop. So England basically invaded and said, no, you will buy I opium. And then as punishment for trying to stop England selling them drugs, uh, England took Hong Kong. China, of course, was clever and said we want it back in 150 years. And England was like, sure, whatever. 150 years later, China's like, <clears throat> uh, Hong Kong. And England's like, who, what? And anyway, so as far as China's concerned, this is theirs. And China has not forgotten the opium wars. So by signing that bill, he's really offended China. There's also the... <clears throat> internment of the, the, the Muslim minority populations in China, and there's a bill going through right now which Trump has to sign. Those things are making China angry. And then I can't help wondering, if Trump went to China with a beautiful, in his words, trade deal, would China maybe just not say, no, no. You know what? The trade war is hurting China. Let's assume that the trade war is hurting China more than it's hurting America. I don't know, but let's say it is. But China is more able to manage it. Why? Well, because it's a control of command economy. They own the media. 
so they can say whatever they want. They own the politicians, et cetera, et cetera. China can manage the problem better. China also has, and, and we might think this as, as non-Chinese people, China has amazingly strong patriotism. They will say, you know what, a bit of pain to get that orange man, like, give us the pain. We'll take it. So suddenly I think, hang on a second, China might be controlling this, which means we might have trade wars until Trump's gone. When does Trump go? Next year or five years' time. Or maybe never. I mean, the maybe never is like a joke, but like I've made jokes about Trump before and they've sickeningly come true. So let's not go there. Short answer, G trade wars remain. They are hurting global GDP and they will continue to hurt global GDP. Here's a random figure. The farmer bailouts that have happened so far this year as a direct result of trade wars are larger than the motor industry bailouts of 2009. Yeah. And farm, uh, farm bankruptcies are up 24% in the US this year. It's tough being a farmer. It's a whole lot tougher when your biggest market won't buy from you. Uh, so US elections, someone will win. I don't know who, there'll be an American. Male or female, black or white. You know what I've learned in the last couple of years? Two horse races, hey? Don't bet. Like two horse races, either side can win. Also understand polling. So typically in a two horse race, your margin of error is three and a half percent. So when you say, oh, this hook's going to win 52, 48, actually your margin of error says toss a coin. Unless they say to you the winner's going to get 54 or 55 percent, the margin of error is saying, toss a coin. And if you think, I'm, I mean, and, and we have two strong pieces of evidence for it, right? Brexit, which every poll said the, 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 the remains were going to win until they didn't. And then Trump, which every poll said Hillary would win until she didn't. Of course, also understand probability. Um, Nate Silver, uh, uh, 538, he said that Hillary's odds of winning were 75%, which means you hold that election four times, Trump wins once. So he won once. I mean, it's not that pollers are corrupt or stupid or evil. It's just that polling isn't in an exact science. And in a two-horse race, sometimes the other horse wins. And these are two-horse races. Um, he's not going to get impeached, not because he isn't a crook, but because he's not going to be impeached. Uh, very interestingly, no president in the history of the U.S. has won from a weak economy. Uh, most recently, Daddy Bush, the first Bush president, weak economy, lost to Clinton. Presidents don't get second terms with weak economies. But I don't know that that might, I mean, that no longer, I mean, like, I'm not putting my head in the block here anyway. I'm telling you an American's going to win. Um, not a Kenyan, an American. But so can he make trade peace to juice the market? I don't think he can. Uh, I'm not sure he has the ability anymore. So can he, does he need to? Can he win in a weak economy? So the short answer is no. The long answer is everything that Trump has done, I said he couldn't do, so heck, maybe he can. Someone will be president of the, of the US in 2021, and there's frankly a 50-50 chance it is President Trump. And then there's Brexit, please, any day now. I mean, I don't mind. So they've got an election next week, Wednesday. You know what? Someone's going to win. It's going to be an Englishman. So the English politics is really fun because they have constituencies. So you can get, so, I mean, they, not this election, I think one of the earlier ones, maybe when Cameron was still around, uh, the one party, and I forget, they got such funny parties, they got 28% of the votes, but they only got 4% of the seats because of the way they do that. We, we do proportional representation, they do constituency. There's pros and cons to both. The short answer is that right now, everyone says the conservatives will win, their lead is narrowing. I will tell you the winner next Friday. How about that? Um, Brexit will happen because even, I mean, everyone who's running in that election, except the Oaks who can't win, are saying even if, if Labour win, they are going to do Brexit. Is Brexit a mess? Yes. Is it a stupid idea? Absolutely. Is it bad for the English economy? Without a shadow of a doubt. Is it going to happen? Yeah, it'll happen. Um, which means careful about the UK is the short answer, although bad news is in. So I'll come back to that. There's maybe some opportunities sitting in the UK. So let's go into some hard predictions. Those were the big questions. Now we come to some real McCoys. SA Inc., our market is cheap. Forward PE is 14 times. Our forward PE in January of 2009 was 13.8. I can't find, my data only goes back to the early 80s. I can't find a time at which point our forward PE was lower. And that forward PE is assuming earnings growth of 10%, which might be a stretch. 
Maybe we only get 5% earnings growth, in which case our forward PE is 14.8. It is sub-15. Our dividend yield is 5%. I can't find another time in the history of our stock market where the top 40 has been yielding 5%. That's obviously before tax. This market is as cheap as it's ever been. A year ago, I would have told you our market was very cheap. Two years ago, I told you it was very cheap. Now I'm telling you that even after an 11% rally this year, this market is cheap. And law, law, I don't want to say law because there's no laws. Theories of markets is that when stuff is cheap, people start to, at some point, they buy it. Because investors want to make a risk-adjusted return. They don't care about politics. They don't care about presidents or IMFs or all of that sort of thing. They just want to know, if I put money here, can I make a return? And if they think yes, well, then they'll put money here. And I go back to last time our market was this cheap. During the financial crisis, I was working at Standard Bank. I was getting bonuses twice a year. And I couldn't wait for bonus day because I just got my bonus and spent it all buying stuff. JSC stuff. Alex, okay, it's not stuff. Buying shares. And the shares that I bought that did badly went up 100%. And that was Standard Bank. I was buying Standard Bank at about around 65, 75 rand. And truthfully, it hit north of 200, but I was selling it at about 140, 150 uh, when Nene was being fired. Does that mean it's going to happen again? I mean, I, look, I, 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 the, the, my, my prediction is yes, as long as things don't go pear-shaped. I'm certainly talking my book and that I'm aggressively investing. I always am. I've got time on my side. This is a cheap market. One day when I tell my nephew that I bought the Satrix 40 for under 50 Rand, he's going to think I've lost a zero somewhere. You know, it's just going to be un completely un 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 uncomprehendable to him. That said... As I said right up front, there are risks, and I'm coming to some of those now, and there is that dark, naggy feeling that this is just not working and that we currently have load shedding and SAA is going bust and how the heck are we going to solve 400 and something billion rand of debt um, at, at ESCOM? And, and I can carry on with the list that is longer than Wall Street um, around what to be fearful of. But none of that changes the very stock stance that our market is cheap. I think a recession for next year is possible. Look, we're halfway in. Even without a recession, we're going to not do 1%. We're going to, you know, half a percent GDP is probably about as good as we can hope for. Um, that all said, market is not the economy. And I think right now the top 40 is an attractive proposition. Um, earnings are ticking. SA Inc. is definitely shrinking. I think we can easily do another 10% plus next year. No bubbles on 10%. Now the bubbles come at 30%. I'm raising that bar. Um, <laughs> and it's Satrix 40 or it's C Top 50. I'll come back to those two. Industrial, see, here's a fun fact. IND25 only has two industrial companies in it. <laughs> uh, Bidvest and Barlow World. And of course, Barlow World makes most of their money in Iberia and places like that, which no, you know, no one wants to go to. Um, it's really NASPAS, which is 28.8, Process is 6.5. Uh, Richmond and ShopRite are the two biggies in there. I own both. Uh, Aspen might be, a, 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 if you want to take a little risky punt somewhere, Aspen's not a bad. i tell you why. I think the growth story for Aspen is weak, but the fear for Aspen was their balance sheet and their debt um, and their Getting rid of the for milk formula and more recently selling one of their Asian businesses has fundamentally de-geared that balance sheet and de-risked that balance sheet. So now they can focus on growing the business. I know the stock has run incredibly. It's one of the top performers so far for the year. But even at the current, what, 130-ish or so, it's got potential for upside there. Um, financials down 7%. Dividends saved them. It is doing it, – it, 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 our banks are cheap, cheap, cheap. And I said that a year ago. The downgrades will hurt them in terms of price. Also understand that the bank cannot have a higher downgrade than a sovereign. So when our country goes to junk, our banks go to junk, all of them. But that's fine because they're not going bust. It just means some investors can't invest in them because they have a mandate that says investment grade quality only. They're Balance sheets are incredibly strong. Their Basel requirements, they are well in excess of Basel requirements. Their impairments are at ridiculously low levels of sub 1%, in some cases sub half a percent. Our banks are cheap, and they have been cheap now for two or three years. They absolutely have been. And when I say, I mean, pick any of the big four. Okay, Capitec, not cheap. 
no, no. Love, love me some KP Tech, but not cheap. The other banks are cheap. Um, and I'm not talking Invest Tech either. Invest Tech is interesting. I think the unbundling uh, of 91, which is a really curious name, uh, will create some value unlock much as it did for Old Mutual. But as we saw with Old Mutual, be careful because the value unlock can also unravel when you start firing CEOs and stuff like that. Um, I also like Coronation. I hold it. Coronation is exactly the same price as when I bought it, except I have received three dividends from it, uh, and they pretty much paid 100%, sitting in a dividend yield of around 8 or 9%. So let's assume that drops to 7.5%, 7%. You're getting the same rate as you would get cash in the bank, but you've got the optionality of coronation. And what we have seen is their funds are starting to do a bit better, uh, which means they can get some performance fees out of the scenario. And a market that starts to broadly do better means performance fees and assets under management growing at the same time. Uh, I think I've held coronation for a year and some change, maybe 14, 15 months. Still hold it, still like it. I stress this is in my second tier portfolio, not till death do us part. I hold it until I don't love it and then I sell it. And when you want to know when I sell it, all my shares are on my vanity page, simonbrown.coza, so you can find out when I do sell it. Uh, resources, so the commodity oversupply, which basically was at its peak in about 2009, 2010, has largely worked its way out of the system. We are at a fair bit of equilibrium in the commodity supply right now. Some of that helped by China wanting to kick out uh, uh, sort of the dirty uh, steel miners, so they want certain better grades of iron ore, which fortunately is exactly what Kumba has. Kumba is at 64.5 instead of 62. I don't know what it means, but if you're an iron ore trader, it means a heck of a lot. Um, trade wars are hurting less than I had anticipated, but they're hurting GDP. What we're seeing, though, is the new response to struggling economies is you can't lower rates because, well, hey, like they're at zero. So you do infrastructure spend and that plays into commodities. My favorites here are always going to be the big uh, diversified uh, BHP Billiton. Glencorb, yeah, or Anglo-American. Um, but if you want a single commodity stock, your Sabanya Stillwater is your story. The debt in that balance sheet has practically run its way out. And they are, at, at current commodity prices and RAND levels, these guys are like a printing press. They just print money. And their debt will be, they will pay a dividend probably first half of 2021, maybe late 2020 but their debt is going to disappear. And Neil Frondman is on record as saying, you know what, it's time to maybe stop doing deals. Let's start returning some cash to shareholders. So single commodity stocks are high risk, but if you want some single commodity exposure, Sabanya still water. Gold? No, gold. It's not the 80s, folks. We've left the 80s behind. Retailers. Yeah, it was a tough 18. Turned out it was an even tougher 2019. Who knew? Uh, it's not me. That's quite patently obvious, right? Um, so, the, again, they are well positioned. What's been hurting the food retailers, and I stress here, we're talking food. What's been hurting the food retailers is a lack of inflation in the system. And what that means is that your costs are going up 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 percent. Your security, your staffing, your rentals, your ESCOM, your water, your insurance is all going up, but your revenue isn't. Because if you put your food price up and your competitor didn't, you lose market share, so everyone just keeps their food flat. So ShopRite's had 1.12 thousand items that were in deflation. Um, that number is coming down. We are starting to see some food inflation work its way into the system, um, and there is certainly dry conditions looming. Now, I tried to discover if we were under threat of drought next year, and frankly, it turns out it depends which meteorological weather station people you read. The Japanese say no. The Australians say we're dead, um, and the Europeans say we don't know where Africa is. But what we do know, notwithstanding the rain, is that it is hot and dry out there. And, and whether we are in drought, obviously, it is, we are in a drying cycle. And I say cycle, I mean, probably until we go up in a ball of flame. It's called global warming. Um, but the point is, is that the, that will then aid food inflation. And that then gives them pricing power. And that then gives them their margins back. My preferred in this space is ShopRite. They got destroyed in Africa this, this year on the rest of the continent. 
two, three years ago, they were making 1.6, 1.8 billion. This year, they lost 250 million. Uh, last year, they had problems with strike action and IT implementation. Those are both behind them. The rest of the continent will start to come right. Hyperinflation inflation in Angola is slowing. Currency weaknesses are working their way out. So that should start to come back, if nothing, to break even. Pick and pay, the turnaround has actually happened. i got to say, I spent a lot of time in Finweek giving Richard Brasher stick and saying, dude, this is taking a long time. You know what, with respect to Mr. Brasher, well, yeah, these things take a long time. Sorry, sir, you were right and I was wrong. Uh, he has turned the business around. Now he's got to start growing those margins. He's even started doing that. He's unlikely to get to, to, to ShopRite margins, simply because ShopRite's got the rest of the continent to benefit it, but certainly uh, pick and pay is well positioned, but a little bit expensive. My, my favorite here remains ShopRite, uh, and then a Woolies or a pick and pay. Woolies have got the problem of clothing, which they get wrong every year except occasionally. And now suddenly they've got it right twice in a row and that bothers me. Like have they actually got it right or is it now going to be not working for 10 years? But the point is I need new suits, so I'll go help their sales. Although actually I tried that this year and they didn't have suits I liked. See that? Anyway. Um, and Australia. Australia, the big story is they overpaid. We know that. That's out of the picture. The Elizabeth Street store, the conversion is finished in March. Currently it's half a construction site. Whether it was a good acquisition or not, Actually, no, we know, we know the answer to that. It was not a good acquisition. Its ability to start making money will be much improved by the Elizabeth Street store being finished. And now they can start focusing on that and they can start turning profit into it. Um, I think it was a terrible acquisition. I think in time they will sell it. Probably not any time soon because that's awkward. Um, but they will eventually. But Woolies Food SA is a machine. Man, those results are something else. Return of equities north of 30%. I mean, it is just something else. Woolies has had a good year, as opposed to ShopRite. Of the three, if I had to pick one, it would be ShopRite. I have, I do own it, and I have been buying it at 128, at 118, and again at 114. And then it's like, I can't buy more because I'm going to get a board seat, and then I've got to be friendly to Christo. If you really want to be brave and you think that a turnaround can happen quickly, and let me remind you that turnarounds don't happen quickly, but if you think they can, MassMart. MassMart has been a disaster of an investment ever since Walmart walked in, or Cockershaw saying, we're going to take it over. Oddly enough, when that deal happened, I was interviewing Christo, uh, sorry, Whitey Besson at the time, and I said to him, I call him Mr. Besson because I can't call him Whitey. <laughs> I said to him, Mr. Besson, and he's called me Whitey. I'm like, uh, Mr. Besson. Um, I said, Walmart's coming to, to Africa, South Africa, Beachhead. Do you think we'll learn some lessons from them? And he leans back in his chair and stretches his arm. And he's like tiny, he's like short, but presence. Leans back in the chair, laughs and says, young man, we're going to teach them how to do retailing. Well, hey, Mr. Besson won, Walmart zero. He has taught them. However, they're now bringing a Walmart lifer in. I think he's coming in to sell it because Walmart has got everywhere. So when retailers go offshore, they lose. Walmart went to Mexico. It didn't work. Walmart went to Europe. It didn't work. The English went to Europe. They failed. Retailers must stay at home. That's just the lesson that we know. Um, I think they're putting it up to sell it. So I think he's going to do some kitchen sinking and some highly aggressive stuff. I think it might be good for the share price. You want a risky plug? Mass Smart might be your one. Property, yeah. So quick aside, that building is still there. That's not the JC building. The JC building is the uh, concrete one next door. But you can go in it and the trading floor is still there. And if you just tell the security man that you're there to, be, to go to the church, he's like, oh, yeah, cool. And you can go see the trading floor. Um, that's as an aside. Uh, property is still very, very cheap. The yields are great. So we've got two things in property that are classic buys. Price below net asset value, yield above the 10-year government bond. Those are both classic buy property. Of course, two problems. Yields can go down and NAV can go down. And right now, they are both going down. So property is cheap, but it's getting cheaper. And that's not going to change anytime soon. That said, I have a lot, I have tons of property, man. And I go to, it used to be when I go to a shopping center, I own like half a square inch. Now I go to a shopping center, that whole towel is mine. I'm just not sure they're going to move anytime soon. I'm happy to hold them because of the yield I get. And I hold them in my tax-free. 
So I hold them in tax free, sitting pretty there. And I've actually got some outside because now my tax free is filling up, etc. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not saying property is a good bet for 2019, but if you want some cash flow, property is paying it, and you're buying at or around NAV. That can't be bad. Interest rates. So I'm trying to write a cover story for Finweek around how, what is this negative yield. So the first thing is negative yield is not new, right? Gold is the classic negative yielding asset. Cash is negative yielding because of inflation. Negative yielding isn't new. It's just it's low interest rates and negative interest rates like don't work in our brain. But maybe it's our brain that's wrong. However, can we put this genie back in the bottle? Can the U.S. get their rates back to 5% again in some point in my lifetime? The answer is no, surely. Which means these rates are staying lower, which means the next financial crisis, the U.S. gets negative rates and Europe gets minus 5%. This is the new world we live in. And that should scare the beheckness out of you. Because what happens with low rates? We borrow recklessly. What happens when you borrow recklessly? We buy stuff we shouldn't. We push up asset valuations. And then one day it goes pear-shaped. And this is the single biggest threat to planet Earth, is these low interest rates. And it ain't going away. And I don't know how it does go away. There's one way. So, so actually, I've got some ideas. How does it go away? Well, we just jack up rates. And we have the defaults and a giant financial crisis. And we work our way through it, and we come out the other side. And ain't no one, no, ain't no politician going to do that. And if you're a central banker and do that, you're going to be an ex-central banker before you finish your breakfast. So what about debt forgiveness? That's where it goes. Because here's what's happened, right? Global GDP trugs along, dum 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 dum. And in a perfect world, the value of all the stock markets, etc., would kind of be on global GDP. Except no. Global GDP has gone dum 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 dum, but valuations have gone through the roof. And that disconnect between the two is the biggest it's ever been, getting constantly bigger, and it is, I think, the scariest thing. That and global warming are the two things that, well, if I was kept awake at night, they would keep me awake. I sleep like a baby. So the only way out of this, frankly, is ginormous debt forgiveness. And whether it happens at sovereign level or corporate level or individual, I'm not sure. It's not happening at an individual. It might be corporate. It might be sovereign. But, I mean, you think we have a debt problem? The U.S. has $20 trillion of debt problem. Ours is, ours is tiddlywinks compared to theirs. This ends ugly. But it is a can. We can kick down the road for a long, long time. And when I say long time, like all of our lives. Like we can kick, we've been kicking this can for 100 years, actually 90. Can we kick it for another 90? Sure. At some point, do we get something that makes the Great Depression look like a kid's playground? Maybe, because I don't know how else this ends. This, I mean, this ends ugly or very ugly or extremely ugly. Those are the only ways. China, world's second largest economy, marching on, but slowing. The Chinese economy is slowing. Now, firstly, that makes sense. If China carried on growing at 7% a year for the rest of forever, it would be bigger than, than the universe, never mind bigger than America. It has to slow. That's just the law of big numbers. But it's not helped by global uh, by trade. <coughs> Excuse me, not helped by trade wars <coughs> and not helped by an economy that is that is doing okay but not doing grand. So China's fine, but certainly a little bit worrying. I get my China exposure via Richmond and Discovery. I'm happy with that right now. I don't need any more China exposure. The U.S. So the U.S. had a 13-year cyclical bear market, peaked in 2001, and didn't get above that level until 2013. That is a cyclical bear market, a decade and change of going absolutely nowhere. What happens after a cyclical bear market is what we call a cyclical bull market, where it just goes up and up and up and up and up like crazy stuff. We are currently in the cyclical bull. It, probably, it can last another five years, maybe even another decade. Along the way, there will be, as there was in December last year, significant pullbacks. But in essence, 
that thing can go and it can go like crazy. We are in the longest economic expansion ever in America and the second longest in terms of return on the market. The reason second longest, dot com beats it, dot com beats it because in 99, the NASDAQ in one year went up 100%. It doubled in a year. We've got some way to beat that. Assuming nothing goes crazy, this is not over anytime soon. This can carry on going. I do think we're going to get a pause in the U.S. I think with the election mania, I think with the trade wars, I think that the 20 plus percent return is unlikely for 2020. Remember, I said that last year and I was wrong, but I'm saying it again. Um, and what I'm saying is careful of this idea of, sit of sitting in cash. Oh, the world is ending. I'm a sit in cash. A year ago, you could have made a brilliantly compelling argument to sit in cash, and you are markedly poorer as a result today if you sat in cash. The point is that markets go up more than they go down, and our ability to time those down bits is zero. Now, I know someone who went to cash about there, 2012. He's American. He went to cash in 2012 because he was worried. Now, he doesn't know what to do like should he get in i'm like dude don't touch it because as sure as murphy when he gets back in the thing will collapse <laughs> so longest economic expansion tech pro tech profits are the driver mostly driving it higher very important those tech companies the fangs actually make money facebook Google or Alphabet uh, and Microsoft, they print cash. Those little ear buddy things that Microsoft, that, that Apple sells, uh, ear, ear, earpods. If they were a company on their own, they would be the 32nd largest company in America. Yeah, that pondered my brain. <laughs> things you stick in your ear. Yowza. The trick is, is that it is all tech profits. Uh, reversion to the mean, it has got too steep too far. It's got ahead of itself. We've also got inversion uh, 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 of the rates, and we've also got ISM under 50 for four months in a row. Both of those have preceded recessions, although we've also had those without recessions. I think US GDP is going to slow. I think it's going to get bitterly close. It might not go into recession. If it does, it will be short and sharp. I also think we're probably going to have a modest year's return. If you're worried about the US, that uh, ETF down there, GlowDiv, from core shares is brilliant because in order to be included as an American company, you need 25 years of dividend payments. And companies such as Apple don't because they were bankrupt 25 years ago. Alphabet didn't exist 25 years ago, neither did Facebook. So that ETF is very low on tech. Tech's been driving it. If things go wobbly, tech's going to take the pain. If you want to try and avoid the pain, glow div. European Union, yeah, puddling along. Germany avoided recession. Like, yes. I still think Europe has better opportunity than, than, than the US in terms of return. They had a brilliant 2019. I think they can do it in 2020. Uh, I prefer the Ashburton. But if you want some real risk, Capco. Why? Because Brexit. Why? Because we're terrified of Brexit. You know what Brexit is? It's a terrible idea. You know what it isn't? The end of the world. They own some of the most valuable property in London. And as the cliche goes, no one's making more property well, until we get to Mars. So 2020, will the bear come out and play? I am not anticipating a violent, horrible bear. I am anticipating some GDP contraction. I think we might see some, ma some major global economies, potentially the U.S., either getting into or getting very close to recession. I expect those recessions to be short, sharp, and sweet. I think stock markets are doing okay. The U.S. is expensive, but I think the S&P can probably get to 34, 34.50. Um, and then we can have a 20% sell-off, and then it can go off, and it can close green in the year. 87, the single biggest one-day crash in the history of markets, and the S&P 500 closed green for the year. Because it went like crazy, crashed, and then went like crazy, and ended the year up 3%, but was green for the year. And I think we can see similar scenarios here. It's still the, the, the global economy of note, but I think modest returns, I think Europe likely to do better. So some stocks quickly to close with. For local, either the top 50 from Core or the Satrix 40. I'm agnostic. I own Satrix 40 by the truckload because I've been buying it for 19 years. Uh, and it's got an expense ratio of 0.1%, and I love cheap. Food retailers, ShopRite, Pick and Pay, Woolies. My pick would be ShopRite, but they all they're all quality, and they all can do. If we start seeing some food inflation, they can expand those margins. They can do well. Coronation for my financials. What the Citrix Finney? When we get downgraded and the, and the financials collapse, 
is going to be a point to buy like crazy. I don't know when it'll be, but it'll be there sometime. And Citrix Finney is a nice way of doing that. Uh, resources, it's BHP or Anglo. BHP, my preference. Some people prefer Anglo because of your diamonds and other bits, but I think diamonds are a myth. Small caps, I think small caps, if everything goes right, and that is a giantest if you've ever seen in your entire life. Small caps are starting to look interesting because they are just so cheap. How do we know they're cheap? Because more than 20 stocks have delisted from the JSC this year. And you only list delist stocks for two reasons, fraud slash bankruptcy, or they're cheap, cheap, cheap. And they are cheap, cheap, cheap. This index already been running, but I think if, if, things, if things go swimmingly, there might be some space there. Your punts are Capco for the UK, are Comair for SAA, and MassMart, because I think the Americans want to sell it, but they need to dress it up first. Uh, your globals, uh, Signia EU, but I, I always, my international, I keep vanilla. I stay with my Ashburton 1200. If you want to get niche, you can go Europe. If you want to go safe, you go with the Glow Div from Corsairs. Uh, Brexit will happen, <laughs> finally. I mean, surely. I mean, please. Um, I think a short and sharp recession at worst and probably modest returns. Interest rates, they low. I don't know how we get interest rates back high again. I think we will get full junk. I do not think we will get an IMF bailout in 2020. Um, I, th I think our economy is in trouble, but I don't think the trouble is solved by 100 or 200 billion from the IMF. I think there are other ways we can manage that. I think SAA will get an equity partner, something like maybe a uh, Ethiopia Airlines, maybe Turkish. One of those folks might use us as their sort of because we're an end of line, and that's always a bad place to be for an airline. You don't fly to us en route to somewhere else. You fly to us to come here. Um, but I think we might they might get an equity equity partner. But SA is in trouble. I mean, they're going to lose customers, right? I'm just one, but I'm my logic. I mean, there are many other people out there who are thinking, yeah, okay, do I want to go on holiday or do I want to stay at an airport with SAA? Um, I think we're going to start seeing some big arrests next year. We've seen some this year, but they haven't been big enough. I think they'll be real. We need a change of sentiment, and that, more than anything, I think, changes sentiment. As I said, we've actually had a good year financially as individuals with investments. It doesn't feel like it. I think something like that can make it start to feel like it. And I don't know who's going to be the arrests, but, I mean, if I were – I mean, Shamil Batoy is the real McCoy. I mean, she really, really is. She came into a, an NPA that had been absolutely gutted. It takes time to restaff, to find the people, to train. She's got the budget. Mbueni gave her money in his medium-term budget policy statement. She's got the money. She will start arresting people. Uh, and there is going to be no trade peace or impeachments. Both sad faces for those. Your ETFs, your long-term portfolio, just carry on carrying on. As always, buy your tax-free investments. We will be back in February. We'll delve down the tax-free accounts. But you know, a bunch of you are like, yo, that's hard work. Yeah, yeah, they just carry on buying your ETFs. There is nothing wrong with 98% of individuals should just buy ETFs. Few of us should try and be clever. And then sometimes we look stupid at the end of it. And that, ladies and gents, brings me back to my pairs. The risks are getting bigger. The biggest risks are trade wars. The biggest risks are elections happening out there. The biggest risks are global economies. The biggest risks are also low interest rates. There's a lot of things out there which are looking spooky. In of themselves, none of them might happen. All of them might happen. I think we can probably navigate it. I think 2020 might be a rough year, but I think we can come out the other side without having to pull out any of our pear-shaped scenarios. But they exist. And then the question is, if you are short on time, cash is not a bad idea. If you're not short on time, ignore it. You've got time on your side. Uh, for being young, time is of the abundance. And the more time you have, absolutely the easier it is. So every year I come here and I talk about this blasted car. The good news is it came this year. It was there. It went 630 miles per hour, almost hit the world record. And then they went home. They were just testing. They're coming back again next year. They're going to do 1,000 miles an hour. The most striking thing is, that's not a car. It's just a rocket with wheels. The scariest thing is, that thing has two Jaguar F-type engines to feed the fuel into the engine. Not to run it, just to pump fuel. 
This thing is epic. I said it was coming in 16. I was wrong. 17, wrong. 18, it came. It's coming next year. They're going to set a record. They're doing it up in the Northern Cape. It's going to be totally, insanely awesome. You should be there. We'll do a power hour because then the JC can pay. Contact details, ladies and gents, etc. Uh, it's 2020. My year is over. I'll finish quickly with two things. I really, really appreciate the support, as Paul said, for coming through, for watching webcasts, for asking questions, for keeping us honest and on our feet. We have huge amounts of fun, but if there weren't peeps to talk to, it wouldn't be half as much fun. And I hope you all make pots and pots of money very, very slowly. I hope you have awesome holidays, and I hope that 2020 doesn't bite. Ladies and gents, thank you very, very much for your time.